وما خلق الذكر والأنثى إن سعيكم لشتى فأما من أعطى واتقى وصدق بالحسنى فسنيسره لليسرى وأما من بخل واستغنى وكذب بالحسنى فسنيسره للعسرى وما يغني عنه ماله إذا تردى إن علينا للهدى وإن لنا للآخرة والأولى فأنذرتكم نارا تلظى لا يصلاها إلا الأشقى الذي كذب وتولى وسيجنبها الأتقى الذي يؤتي ما له يتزكى وما لأحد عنده من نعمة تجزى إلا ابتغاء وجه ربه الأعلى ولسوف يرضى الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Inshallah ta'ala, we're studying Surah Al-Shams today and I'm uh, experimenting with a new approach to conducting the sessions. So please make dua that it's a successful experiment, um, The experiment is as follows. I'm going to try to establish the parallels or at least articulate the parallels between this surah and the previous one, lump sum in the beginning. And then we'll talk about the layout of this surah second and then actually go into the ayah by ayah tafsir study and the word-by-word word analysis, inshaAllah ta'ala. So we begin, of course, based on that methodology, with the series of parallels between Surah Al-Layl, which we're studying now, and Surah Al-Shams, the one that preceded it. So while the Shams mentions in its beginning, وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا This is in the previous surah. So it, was, it mentioned the day, and then it mentioned the night. And it mentioned the verb jalla with day, and it mentioned the word yaksha, the verb yaksha with night. So to be bright and also to cover up. The opposite sequence is being used in the very beginning of this surah. So we're finding, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى It's the reverse. So there, there was day and night, and now here is night, night and day. The other thing that's interesting to note from a grammatical or syntax point of view, is in the previous surah we learned yaksha ha. There was the additional pronoun ha. So we learned that the night covers the sun up. It covers up the sun. Yaksha ha, the ha referring to the sun. Here Allah just says, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى He doesn't mention the object of the verb as you say in English or the maf'ulun bihi. It is not mentioned. The dhamir muttasil is not mentioned. And the benefit of that, of not mentioning it is, it of course creates the question. When you say, I swear by the night as it covers up. That's what the beginning says. وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى I swear by the night as it covers up. The obvious question that pops in your mind is, what does it cover up? What does it cover up? And of course, the answer to that has already been established in the previous surah. It covers up the sun, right? As many of the mufassirun have commented. What we're learning here is, this, this surah is almost expecting you to look at the previous surah as a reference point. Because by saying yawsha by itself and not mentioning its object, you're forced to think about the object that's already been mentioned in the previous surah. Similarly, Allah Azza wa Jalla in the previous surah says, وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا That's in the previous surah, in Surah Al-Shams. Allah says the day as it makes the sun brilliant. But here the day itself is brilliant. وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى Now we know what makes it brilliant in the previous surah, the manifestation of the sun itself. Right? So the two are intricately connected, even, how, even the way you think about the subtleties in language. One is forcing you to consult the other. Then another interesting nuance that's been mentioned about the two verb tenses. When Allah speaks about the night, and it's covering up, he uses the present tense, yagsha, al-fi'l al But when he talked about the day making bright, he didn't use the present tense, al mudari he used al-madi. Jallaha and tajalla, they're both madi. They're both the past tense. But when he spoke about the night and it covering up, he used the present tense. Now in English, we think of past and present tense in very simple terms. But in the Arabic language, one of the benefits of the present tense, al mudari 
is incompletion or partiality. You know, some little bit of something and then a little bit of something more, etc. It's an incomplete sort of a thing. While the past tense is considered a complete act. It's something complete. And the way it's been commented on, I'll just read the Arabic off to you. وَاسْتِعْمَالُ صِيغَةِ الْمُضَارِعْ مَعَ فَعْلْ يَغْشَى هُوَ لِأَنَّ اللَّيْلَ يُغْشِي شَيْئًا فَشَيْئًا بِالتَّدْرِيجِ The benefit of using the present tense with the night covering up is that it only covers little by little. It takes stages to cover up and it doesn't necessarily cover everything. Even though the night is dark, it doesn't make everything invisible. It doesn't hide everything like it hides the sun. Actually, we learned in the previous surah, something still, a remnant of the sun, still comes out and is bright, which is the moon that follows it. Right? وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا So we know that the, the present tense here, the benefit of it is, that it's not absolute in its covering. But when Allah speaks about the day, He says, jallaha and tajalla, Which are past tenses, which means they're absolute. It's the, the whole act is done. Meaning the day immediately brightens everything. And makes everything manifest, and nothing is hidden now. Everything is out in the open. So the way that's covered, uh, when, when the Mufassir speaks, he says, هُوَ لَيْسَ كَالنَّهَارَ الَّذِي يَتَجَلَّى دَفْعَةً وَاحِدًا بِمُجَرَّدِ طُلُوعِ الشَّمْسِ It's not like the, the morning time, which immediately in one shot, it gives brilliance to everything. Once day manifests, everything starts becoming clear immediately. The next oath that Allah Azza wa Jal takes, that's again, in keeping with comparison from the previous surah, Allah said in the previous surah, وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا This was we learned in Surah Al-Shams. So Allah spoke about the sky and its architecture, and the earth and its expanse and its smoothness. But now here, He takes a different oath. He doesn't mention the sky and the earth anymore. He says, وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى How remarkable the creation, uh, uh, how remarkably He created, or what could have created such a remarkable creation of the male and the female. So the previous surah had the contrast of the sky and the earth, and this one has the contrast of the male and the female. And there are actually many parallels between the sky and the earth as a contrast, and the male and the female as a contrast. And we're being asked almost to reflect upon the parallels between them. The sky and the earth go together for a larger purpose and create a day. The day is not, and, and, you know, uh, and the sky, it works in cohesion with the earth to produce vegetation. The earth could not produce what it produces unless it gets help from the sky and the water comes down from the sky. So they work together for the process of life to continue. And so does male and female. So the plant life on the earth, it's like the, the earth gets impregnated with plants. Just like the fe female gets impregnated by the male. So there's these parallels of the process of life that take two very com completely different things two contradictory things, and makes them part of a whole. As though they're not two separate entities, they're part of one larger picture. Though they're apart, they're part of one larger scheme. So in the previous surah, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned different aspects of his takhliq, of the process of creation. He used the, word, the verbs, banaha, tahaha, he constructed, he, you know, he leveled out, right? he built. These are all different aspects of creating. But here he used the comprehensive term, almost putting the two together when he says, وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى So the, the word خَلَقَ is more comprehensive. It sort of sums up what the previous partial verbs were illustrating in the previous surah, بَنَاهَا and طَحَاهَا Then another very interesting nuance is that in the previous surah, Allah Azza wa Jalla spoke in the third person. He spoke in the third person. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا so he spoke continuously in the third person. But in this surah we will find Allah Azza wa Jal immediately switches over and he starts speaking to the, in the second person. So for example he says, فَأَنذَرْتُكُمْ نَارًا تَلَبَّ I'm warning you, I've warned you. So it goes from third person to second person. And we should understand the purpose of going from third person, he, she, they, to second person. Third person is general. When I say, you know, a person should be good, a person should be generous, a person should be kind, in your mind, you're thinking it could be any person. It's not necessarily you, I'm talking in general terms. But when I say you, I'm not talking about just anyone, I'm talking about you. It's like I'm taking a universal lesson and making it applicable directly to you. So the previous surah had these universal lessons in the third person. But now we're learning, they're not just for, for you to think about in theory, these lessons apply to you directly. So there's this switch from third person, universal, to second person specifically to us as the audience or the audience, the original audience of the Prophet ﷺ. So, in the previous surah now, we learned, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا 
We learned about this incredibly balanced creation of the nafs and how Allah programmed it to recognize its evil capacities and its capacity to protect itself. What is good for it, what is bad for it. And innate nature, a fitrah was already put inside of it that it can figure out what's good and what's bad and that this is ilham from Allah. Allah inspired it to have this much sense, which you can call a conscience that we talked about last time, right? But in this surah, Allah takes that foundation that He established and he, he tells us, despite the fact that all of you have been pre-programmed with such an ability, it's still interesting to note, in sa'yakum la shatta, that all of your efforts are all over the place, they're dispersed. And we'll talk about the word shatta when we come, by, come to ayah by ayah tafsir. But essentially what we're learning is, even though all of you know what is good and what is bad, essentially, we still don't find all of you doing the same good things. We find some of you are doing good and some of you are doing bad, your efforts are all over the place. In nasa'iyakum la shatta. The other thing to note is in the previous surah, Allah mentioned the feelings or the you know what goes on inside the nafs. Wa nafsi wa masawaha fa alhamaha fujuraha wa taqwaha. Qad aflaha man zakkaha wa qad khaba man dasa. Cleansing the nafs, an internal thing, right? Putting the nafs to dust, an internal thing, a psychological, a, a disease of the heart, if you will, right? A disease of the nafs. But here we're finding the outside, the the outwardly. So the previous surah talked about the nafs and its inner state, and immediately now in nasa'iyakum, your efforts, and efforts are outward, they're actions. So the inside, what's going on inside the person, and what's happening outside are being compared in between these two surahs. Similarly, in the previous surah we learned, in surah al-shams, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَ The one who cleansed it, who was able to clean themselves up, literally, they are the ones who have actually already attained success. In this surah, Allah will describe what does that mean. How do you attain that success? In the previous surah, it was just left as a declaration, whoever made an attempt to cleanse it, has attained success. The how was not answered. The how, the question mark remained. Now that question is being answered, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى وَاتَّقَى وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ لِلْيُسْرَى That entire definition is basically an exposition. It's explaining what Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in the previous surah about the one who attained success. That path to success is being described. Similarly, in the previous surah, Allah said, wa, you know, uh, وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَ The one who basically abased his nafs, put it in the dust, basically literally failed. What is that path to failure? That is going to be described in this surah when we study the translation, وَأَمَّا مَنْ بَخِلَ وَاسْتَغْنَى وَكَذَّبَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ لِلْعُسْرَى So that, that the two summarized declarations are now being given for, full detail in this surah. Another very interesting and subtle beauty of this surah is the, so, the two problems of rebellion. What is on the outside is tughyan. كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودُ بِطَغْوَاهَا This is what we learned in the previous surah. The, that Thamud lied against the truth because of their rebellion. They rebelled against the truth. But in this surah, the disease is not rebellion. The disease is something else. وَمَا يُغْنِي عَنْهُ مَالُهُ إِذَا تغدى. Similarly, istagna, Right? So the, what are these words, what do all of them have to do with? They have to do with wealth. We'll find his wealth doesn't benefit him any. He wants to become free of need. In other words, once, you, once this person starts becoming wealthy, they start, stop relying on Allah, they start relying on their wealth. They stop, feel, stop feeling that they're dependent. They feel they're independent because of their wealth. And when you feel independent financially, or you think you can manage on your own, then you don't feel the authority of someone else because you're no longer dependent. You know, when you're working for your boss, and he controls your paycheck, then you're a little more obedient. Because if you, if you, you know, mess around and you do things the way you want to do them, your paycheck's gonna stop. But if you feel you're rich enough, you hit the jackpot, some, you inherited a few million dollars, what happens to your obedience to your boss immediately starts disappearing, rebellion takes course, right? Rebellion comes in, but the source of it was wealth, right? We see this in human nature. So the previous surah mentions rebellion, taghwa, Right? بِتَغْوَاهَا And this surah mentions one of the root causes of rebellion is this, the, the diseased attitude towards one's wealth or one's a- assets. So that's mentioned in the words istaghna. It's mentioned in the words وَمَا يُغْنِي عَنْهُ مَالُهُ إِذَا تَرَدَّ And then finally also to cleanse yourself of that attitude الَّذِي يُؤْتِي مَالَهُ يَتَزَكَّى We'll read that ayah also. So it's a whole, the, the theme has become wealth here. That's become a major problem in the, in the psyche of people. Similarly, and, and this is something remarkable, two kinds of people have been mentioned, right? The, the good, the righteous, وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى And also the wretched, وَكَذَّبَ بِالْحُسْنَى The one who accepts the ultimate good, the one who rejects the ultimate good. But you know, both of these people are in trouble. 
You know, you ever heard the idea of what, what's considered self-righteous? Meaning a, a person does good things. They protect themselves from evil things, they act righteously, they obey Allah, they don't fall into the wrong things. But then they start developing the attitude that they are guided. That they somehow own guidance. Because they're such good people, they are on the right path, they're guided. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions even that as a disease. So He says, إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا لَلْهُدَى we, It is only upon ourselves that we, we take the responsibility of guidance. Guidance is not something you're gonna have. You're never gonna have it, you're gonna keep asking for it. You'll get it when Allah gives it. And the moment you stop asking, it won't be there. So it's not something you can own through your deeds. You have to own it, or you can, you can only get advantage of it when you beg Allah Azza wa Jal for it. Of course, we learn this lesson, very simple lesson. Every time we recite the Fatiha, we ask Allah for guidance. اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ So this was the righteous, and how Allah corrects him in the words, إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا لَلْهُدَى But then there's the wretched. And the wretched person who disobeys and rebels against Allah, who we already said feels free of need, this person thinks that he is in control. He owns. He's in charge. And of course, when you have wealth, the idea is you own something. So Allah says, وَإِنَّا لَنَا لَلْآخِرَةَ وَالْأُولَى It is only we that actually own the hereafter and even the earliest. Meaning this life and the next, the real owner is Allah Azza wa Jal. The real owner is Allah. So we'll talk about this, the, the two corrections that are being made. One of the self-righteous and the other of the wretched, wretched in these ayat. Then a really interesting and subtle nuance. In the previous surah, فَكَذَّبُوهُ فَعَقَرُوهَا The nation of Thamud, they lied against the messenger number one, and the, the ultimate crime, the high crime they committed was, they violated the miracle that Allah had sent to them. They disrespected the miracle that Allah had sent to them by slaughtering that camel, فَعَقَرُوهَا right? But the first thing was, they lied against the truth, and then they committed a crime against the miracle. You could put it this way. In this surah we will write, read, الَّذِي كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى The same process, except for the people who are in Quraysh right now. What does Allah Azza wa Jal say? The one who lies against the truth, just like كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودِ فَكَذَّبُوهُ In the previous surah, just like that. But now, what crime are they gonna commit? It's not against the she-camel. What is the miracle Allah sent to the Quraysh? It was the Qur'an. So how, what, what is the crime against the Qur'an? وَتَوَلَّى And he turned away. Turned away from what? Turned away from the Qur'an. So the previous surah committed, the previous nation committed a crime against one miracle of Allah, the she-camel. And this nation is committing a crime against another miracle of Allah, the Qur'an itself. And a, a, a beautiful contrast has been made. In the previous situation, Allah's demand on the kuffar, on the people was, stay away from the she-camel. Stay away from it. And they rebelled against Allah and went towards it and attacked it. And in, in the case of Qur'an, Allah is not saying stay away from Qur'an, He's saying come towards the Qur'an, and they're doing the exact opposite, they're staying away from it. So this contrast has been established in these words. The other thing is the Messenger, Salih alayhi salam. He, sa he warned the people in the previous surah, we talked about the ayah, you know, فَقَالَ لَهُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ نَاقَتَ اللَّهِ نَاقَتَ اللَّهِ Watch out, this is the she-camel of Allah. وَسُقِيَاهَا And its place of drink, be careful. Don't. So He was warning them. He was warning them. In this surah, a step further is taken. In which Allah Himself says, I've warned you. فَأَنذَرْتُكُمْ نَارًا تَلَضَّى Don't even think the Messenger is warning you sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like Salih warned his nation. Don't think like that. It is actually me who's warning you through these words. Don't think these are the words of a man. These are my words. So this incredible warning has been given directly to the people of Quraysh. A step far beyond the warning even given by Salih alayhi salam to his nation. Interestingly also in the previous surah, we, we heard the word Al-Ashqa. Al-Ashqa. إِذِمْ بَعَثَ أَشْقَاهَا When the worst and the most wretched of them got up to try and kill the she-camel, and the gang kind of went behind him, and they, this posse went to do this crime. This is when the messenger warned them. This surah tells us what happens to Al-Ashqa. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, لَا يَصْلَاهَا إِلَّا Al-Ashqa. فَأَنذَرْتُكُمْ نَارًا تَلَضَّى لَا يَصْلَاهَا same exact word, no, there's no accident. Allah says, no one will throw themselves into the fire, into this blazing, flaming fire, except Al-Ashqa. So their behavior was mentioned in the previous surah, and the consequence of that behavior is mentioned in this surah. And by the way, in the previous surah, the consequence was mentioned, but in dunya. 
What was the consequence in dunya? فَدَمْدَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسَوَّهَ That when Allah crushed them and destroyed them and leveled the ground with them, meaning He, he sunk them into the ground as a people, when Allah talked about that destruction upon them, where was that? In this dunya. But that's not enough. There's another side to it, which is the akhirah, the next side. And that's being mentioned here, لَا يَصْلَاهَا إِلَّا الْأَشْقَى Then we find, uh, in, in the previous surah, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, in, at the end, He mentions His punishment against the people. He mentions His punishment. فَدَمْدَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسَوَى In this surah, He mentions how He protects the people. وَسَيُجَنَّبُهَا الْأَتْقَى he, he, he wards off, He pulls you aside, away from the, the direction of harm, the most righteous of the people, the most fearful of the people. So Allah's destructive attitude towards one nation is mentioned in the previous, and Allah's protective attitude towards the righteous is mentioned, in contrast in the conclusion of this surah. In the previous surah, Allah Azza wa mentioned that He doesn't care about the consequences. وَلَا يَخَافُ عُقْبَاهَا وَلَا يَخَافُ عُقْبَاهَا This is His attitude against the wretched. And in this surah at the end, he, he explicates, he explains his attitude towards the righteous when he says, وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى He'll soon be very pleased. He'll soon be pleased. So on the one hand, his attitude towards the wretched in the previous surah, and here the attitude towards the righteous. وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى In this surah, subhanAllah. Similarly, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the, this is a, 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 just an amazing contrast. When Allah mentioned punishment in the previous surah, He quantified it. And what was, the quant- what was the quantifiable phrase? We repeated it before. فَدَمْدَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسَوَّهَا Their Lord crushed them. And you know, the, the verbs دَمْدَمَ We discussed that last time. سَوَّهَا We discussed that. These are the quantifiable punishments. But when it comes to reward, Allah doesn't even put a quantity on it. What does He say? وَمَا لِأَحَدٍ عِنْدَهُ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ تُجْزَى وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى Soon He'll be pleased. Allah doesn't even say, I will give him this much, then he will be pleased. Allah just says, he'll be pleased. What does that mean? That means you can't even imagine how much you you will get, but know one thing. It is so much that you'll be pleased. That this person will be pleased. Yarda, he'll be pleased. SubhanAllah. He'll be content. There'll be nothing left in their imagination. I could have gotten more. There's something more I could have acquired. That thought won't occur there in their mind because the word yarda is used. So this contrast between limited punishment and unlimited reward that is being established between these two surahs. Then finally, before this pair of surahs came, this is of course very intricately connected surah, Surah Al-Shams and Surah Al-Layl. Before them we read Surah Al-Balad. And in Surah Al-Balad, if you remember, there was mention of going up a mountain, right? And we talked about how the righteous path is very difficult, is very high and very difficult. But Allah Azza wa Jal seeks to change our attitude about that difficulty. So when He talks about the one doing good deeds, which apparently sounds difficult, what does Allah Azza wa Jal say? فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ لِلْيُسْرَى we'll, we'll facilitate for him the easiest thing. Meaning Allah calls that high hill, when you take that journey, Allah will Himself would make sure that becomes the easiest thing for you. That there is nothing easier than that. And the one who takes the wrong journey, Allah Azza wa Jal make the, the toughest, the hardest thing easy for him. The hardest thing will become easy for him. And we'll look at a description of those, those words inshaAllah ta'ala when we get to the ayat themselves. Then finally I want to share with you this imagery that Allah establishes of the righteous going... Shh, girls. With the righteous going elevating themselves. The righteous elevating themselves. And the, 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 the wretched putting themselves down. The wretched thinks the more wealth he has, the higher he gets in society. That's what he thinks. The more wealth he has, the higher he is in society. And Allah is telling the righteous to spend. أَعْطَى يُؤْتِي مَا لَهُ Right? And in the, even in Surah Al-Balad we found what categories of people to give. Right? فَكُّ رَقَبَةٍ أَوْ إِطْعَامٌ فِي يَوْمٍ ذِي مَسْغَبَةٍ Etc. Etc. So this idea of giving. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the one who gives is actually the one getting high. Because he's going up the hill. And the one who acquires wealth, thinking that he's become high, what words are used for him? Dasaha, put in the dust. Taradda, you know, falling into a ditch, falling down into a cliff. He's actually lowering himself, where actually he thinks he is elevating himself. Subhanallah. So there's this contrast being mentioned between the righteous who put themselves down before Allah, because Allah is the most high. إِلَّا بْتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِ Allah being the most high, they put themselves down, and Allah is elevating them. 
But the one who put themselves high, Allah is putting them down. So there's this beautiful contrast that is described in between these two surahs. So these were some parallels between the previous surah and this one. Now let's talk a little bit about the layout, the structure of the surah and how it's organized. By the way, what time is Maghrib today? I haven't been around for a week. 8.35, 8.35 okay. So the layout of the surah. Of course the surah begins with a series of aqsam, of oaths. Which we've talked about a number of times now. وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَى وَالْأُنْثَى When an oath is taken, you are being asked to reflect upon each item in the oath, and it will prepare you for what is called جواب القسم The response to the oath, the conclusion, the thesis of the oath. Eventually what is coming. Now what is that thesis? That thesis by the way usually is the center of the entire surah. The entire lesson Allah is teaching in a surah is usually the جواب القسم so where he says in this surah, he takes these oaths by the night and the day, the male and the female, and how, they, how remarkably they're created. Then he gives us the thesis, the fundamental lesson of this surah. What is it? Inna sa'yakum lashatta. Your efforts are truly diverse. Some people are working hard towards righteousness, others working hard towards being wretched and, and, and vile, and in rebellion to Allah. And since this is the thesis of the surah, it should be explained, how do people make these efforts? So the next section of the surah is describing these two paths. So on the one hand you have فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى وَاتَّقَى وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ لِلْيُسْرَى And on the other hand you have the other kinds of efforts. وَأَمَّا مَنْ بَخِلَى وَاسْتَغْنَى وَكَذَّبَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ لِلْعُسْرَى then of course Allah Azza wa Jalla, after mentioning these two, He mentions His role in all of this. When He says إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا لَلْهُدَى وَإِنَّ لَنَا لَلْآخِرَةَ وَالْأُولَى Meaning these two people are working in their own directions. But they should know guidance is his possession. It is upon him to guide. And we'll talk about that in more detail today inshallah after the salah. And the other, the other thing that Allah mentions is that he is in complete ownership of both of them. He knows exactly what they're doing and he's in complete control. Because he himself is the true owner, not only of the hereafter, but what's going on here also. You know the believer who does good things expects rewards in the hereafter. They expand even when they get depressed, what do you tell them? Allah will give you more in the hereafter. And the disbeliever, when he does vicious things, even if you warn him of the hereafter, he says, well, it's not happening now, is it? It's not so bad now, I can do whatever I want now. So they attribute Allah's role both in some way to the hereafter. But Allah Azza wa Jalla lets them know not just al-akhirah wal ula, right here too. Right here Allah is in control also. Allah knows exactly what you're going through here, what you're up to here. And the consequences will be here as well as over there. Inna lana al-akhira wal ula. Then the final part of the surah, the, uh, part four of the surah is basically the warning. And in contrast with the previous surah, though Allah says, you know, فَأَنذَرْتُكُمْ نَارًا تَلَضَّى لَا يَصْلَهَا إِلَّا الْأَشْقَى It's a very interesting kind of warning Allah gives. He says, I'm warning you, I'm warning you, essentially, we're not talking about it in detail right now, I'm warning you of a fire. I'm warning you of a fire. No one will enter it except the worst, the most wretched. Now what kind of language is that? Allah does not say, I'm warning you of the fire and you're the most wretched. He didn't say that. لا يصلاها إلا الأشقى, third person. He says, I'm warning you, the worst people go in it. Now the, the fact that he didn't call you the worst, but he did say the worst people go in it. It causes you to think, if the worst people go in it, why is he warning me? Why isn't he warning the worst people, right? What you're being told is, you may not have realized how far down you've gotten, figure it out for yourself. Maybe you've become a lashqa and you haven't even realized. Maybe you've become the most wretched. You haven't even realized. So I'm warning you, the worst kinds of people end up there. So in parentheses, what we're learning here is, you better not have become one of them. And if you have, you better get your act together. لا يصلاها إلا الأشقى and again in third person, Allah mentions who will be saved from it. Who will be kept completely off, away from the punishment of the fire. It's beautiful language. سَيُجَنَّبُهَا الْأَتْقَى The one, the, you know, the, the most righteous and the most protected even is the meaning, will be kept far off the side of it. You know how somebody pushes you out of way when a danger comes? Like a car's coming and you push to the side to stay safe. Or the mother is crossing the parking lot and the cars are coming, so she keeps her children on the side. This is tajneeb. This is what's called in Arabic, at tajneeb To pull someone just far away from danger. Janaba, to pull them away from danger. Or to be on the side. But tajneeb is the hyperbolized in taf'eel. It means to keep them far away, not even close. You're all the way into the curb. You're inside the building, the car goes by, then you go. Right? You're totally, totally safe. 
Allah talks about these people who are completely and absolutely safe. So on the one hand, the people who are the most wretched who are going to throw themselves into it, and on the other who are the people who are going to be completely safe. And this idea of being far off and safe is very powerful because when the people of hellfire haven't even entered hellfire, they're just looking at it. They haven't even entered it yet. They're close. They're close. You will see the things they say. He'll be crying for death. He'll just be crying for death because he's in proximity of hell. Not because he's in hell, because he's in proximity of it. So it is Allah's gift. So He says He'll keep you far away from it. So this tajneeb that yujannabuha al atqa, this is an incredible gift of Allah. And then Allah finally concludes with, you know, how is He going to reach this point where He can be saved? الَّذِي يُؤْتِي مَا لَهُ يَتَزَكَّى وَمَا لِأَحَدٍ عِنْدَهُ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ تُجْزَدٍ So we learn from the beginning to end, one of the most recurring themes of this surah is wealth. Wealth, wealth, wealth. In the beginning, istighna was for wealth. In the beginning, a'ta was for wealth. a'ta wa taqa In the beginning, we found, وَمَا يُغْنِي عَنْهُ مَالُهُ إِذَا mal came up again. Then at the end, الَّذِي يُؤْتِي مَا لَهُ يَتَزَكَّى Again, Wealth, wealth, wealth. So we're going to learn in this surah, what in the previous surah Allah told us, the one who cleansed it has been successful. And in this surah Allah is going to tell, teach us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you want to clean yourself up, it has a lot to do with your attitude towards your wealth. It has a lot to do with how you think about your money, how you think about your house, how you think about the things you own. And if you think about them in a corrupt way, and, there's not, and by the way, before, a disclaimer, there's nothing wrong with owning wealth. There's nothing wrong with owning wealth. There is something wrong with having wealth not just enter your pocket, but enter into your heart. That's the problem, right? People can have all the wealth in the world, so long as it's not in their heart. Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, when He talks about the, 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 the worst kinds of people, and He doesn't just say they have money, He says they love money. They lo and where's love? It's in the heart. وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ Right? So, and, and he loves it so much, he's always counting it, right? He's always compiling it and counting it. الَّذِي جَمَعَ مَالًا وَعَدَّدًا You're obsessed with something you love. That's what you do. So this, this attitude is what's the center, really the central theme of this surah. And hence we understand the word sa'i in a new light. Sa'i means to make an effort. And we'll talk about that in more detail again, once we go ayah by ayah. But what does sa'i mean? To make an effort. People are making an effort in two directions. Either you want to get wealthy here, or you want to get wealthy over there. Now there is a way you can get wealthy in both. It's hard, but you can do it. It's possible that you can be wealthy here and you can be wealthy there. But understand that when you concern yourself with worldly assets, in your heart, they become the priority. You're thinking about them more than you're thinking about the assets, your savings up there. Then you have become from an ashqa. Then you've turned away at tawalla, the one that's being described, right? So this, this Powerful lesson is going to be the center of this surah. Now, by Ibn Allah, since we still have another 15 minutes before the salah, we'll begin the ayah by ayah discussion of this surah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-layli idha yakhsha. Allah Azza wa again, He swears by the night. I swear by the night as it covers up. I mentioned before, Allah does not mention what He covers up. Because, and this is part of the style of this surah, objects are not mentioned. In other words, you're expected to fill things in. This is one of the great styles of the Qur'an. It expects you not to have everything spelled out for you. It doesn't, it fill, you fill in the blanks yourself. What does it cover up? Figure it out. You should know. You've already read the previous surah. Right? So this, this attitude of filling the blanks, and filling in, and Allah forcing you to think about things, this is one of the most beautiful aspects and features of the Qur'an. That we become a people of thought. We're always thinking. Allah forces us to think. He forces us to think. Similarly, we'll see this later on too. When Nahari ida, and by the way, as opposed to, as in regards to Yagsha, when Ash-Shawkani rahimahullah commented on it, he said, Yugti bi dhulmatihi ma kana mudi'an, meaning he, it covers with its darkness whatever it had light on it before. Also, some have commented that the, when Allah mentions night, he is alluding to kufr, to disbelief. And when Allah mentions day, it is an imagery or an allegory or He's alluding to a revelation which comes like light and it brightens up, all, it gets rid of all the darkness. Right? So revelation gets rid of disbelief and misguidance just like light gets rid of darkness. Now, وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى أَيْ ظَهَرَ وَانْكَشَفَ وَوَضَحَ لِزَوَالِ الظُّلْمَةِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ فِي اللَّيْلِ ذَلِكَ بِطُلُوعِ الشَّمْسَ Shawkani says, 
He says when the, you know, Allah simply is mentioning the removal of the darkness of the night and how it immediately disappears, in no time it disappears by the manifestation of the day. Now, you know it takes a long time for night to creep up. But the brilliance of day happens much 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 faster. It happens very very quickly. Even a little bit of light, a serious change comes over. But evening, it's you know, there's asr and then there's slowly is maghrib and it's crawling in. And this is almost a parallel of iman and kufr. You know, disbelief, it doesn't happen overnight. Corruption in a society doesn't come overnight. It takes a long time before it's, you know, it, the change comes. But if you look at the change of good that the Prophet ﷺ brought, how long did it take? This, the nation was in darkness and shirk for hundreds of years and virtually overnight. 23 years is nothing in the, in the, in the history of a nation. Two decades is nothing, is no time at all. Complete day manifestation, and full manifestation. Complete manifestation. وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى Then Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions, وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى Here we have another discussion on the word ma. It's a similar discussion to the one we had in the previous surah, when we were studying the words, وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا The word ma. The word ma could be understood linguistically, it could be understood as ma al mawsula it's called. Ma al mawsula and it's also to be understood as ma masdariya. Now, what does that mean? Ma al masula means th this statement is saying, and and what it really means is, and I swear by the one, how awesome is the one? What kind of lord is this? What kind of entity is this that could create the male and the female? So ma, which means literally what? What powerful being must this be? And I swear by that powerful being that he created the male and the female. This is ma. This is when, when you consider this ma al mausula. But if you say this is ma mastariya, then the emphasis is not on the creator, but on the creation itself. So the meaning would become how incredibly powerful, how incredibly you know, awe-inspiring the creation of the male and the female. Here again, Allah said male and female. He didn't say, for example, just directly, He didn't say man and woman. Dhakar and unfa can be used for pretty much any creature that has male and female gender. So Allah opened up the scope. Just like Yahsha was left open, Tajalla was left open, male and female is left open. So Allah created male and female out of animals, Allah Azza wa created male and female out of human beings, plants, etc, etc. Now the thing is, these pairs that are being mentioned, there's a profound lesson in them that Amin Ahsan Islahi rahimahullah comments on, that's really beautiful. That this, this pairing, we learn Allah Azza wa says, وَمِن كُلِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَا زَوْجَيْنِ We created every, from everything we created a, a pair. And you know, if you think about a pair, night in and of itself would be destruction. And Allah mentions, what if I only had night for you? What if you, the night became sarmadan? Just, it lasted, it wouldn't go away. How, what a travesty that would be for you. What if day never went away? How difficult life would be for you? So one necessitates the existence of the other. Male by itself, is incomplete, life can't continue. Female by itself, incomplete, it can't continue. And even in our psyche, you, you know, men, they, one of the things that, you know, they, we have tendencies, men have tendencies in them that are very corrupt also. Like we have tendencies towards violence and rage and all of these things. Who calms those tendencies down? Women, our mothers, our sisters, our wives, etc, etc. They calm these tendencies down. Each has even psychological tendencies, psychological weaknesses that the other fulfills. Women have psychological weaknesses that men fulfill. Men have psychological weaknesses that women fulfill. Men have a physical and a, 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 you know, a compatibility with females. Not just a physical but a psychological one too. Subhanallah. How amazingly complementary they are, just like the night and the day is complementary. But we're learning something very profound. If everything is in pairs, then every, you know, this life in itself must have a pair. There's life over here, and it must be paired. This by itself can't be complete. This must be complete only when it meets its other half. What's its other half? Inna la 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 akhira wal ula. The hereafter. So the hereafter becomes a necessary pair to this worldly life. In this worldly life, you have night and day. You have male and female, and they're reminding you everything is incomplete by just by itself. It needs a pair to complete it. Well, this life itself, this world itself, is in ha is half is incomplete. And what will complete it is the life of the next world. SubhanAllah. So dunya paired with akhirah. Inna sa'yakum lashatta. No doubt your efforts 
your efforts, the efforts of all of you. Remember we said in this surah, the person has changed to second person from the previous surah, which was third person. So Allah is talking to the nation directly. Interestingly, in the previous surah, Allah was talking to about Thamud. In distant nation, they, you would talk about them as they, they're gone. But now all of a sudden in the next surah, the warnings and the, the, the description of your state is not in the third person, it's about you. Those lessons, you were being prepared. You were being prepared. You are now ready for this lesson directly. So Allah is turning His attention towards the Quraysh in this surah. إِنَّ سَعِيَكُمْ لَشَتَّى Some Mufassirun have looked at the word kum and have interpreted it in multiple ways. One is that it's addressing the Muslims. That the efforts of the Muslims, there are many, but in the end they complement each other. Most Mufassirun however have said that our efforts being diverse, as is said in the ayah, إِنَّ سَعِيَكُمْ لَشَتَّى Sa'i by the way is to pace really fast. There are many words for running in Arabic. Sa'i means not, it's, it's faster than walking, slower than running, it's pacing. Okay? And you know, we learned this word previously in another surah, you know, ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى When we heard ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى for Fir'aun, we read this word before too. So pacing, meaning concerning yourself, and working quickly and, and, and urgently towards something. This is when somebody paces. When do you see somebody pacing at the bus stop? When do you see somebody pacing through the office building? When they have some really important thing they have to do. They're not quite running, and they're not quite walking either, but they're moving quickly, because there's something concerning them, right? Allah says, these concerns you have that you're running towards and pacing towards, they are all over the place. Lashatta. So Allah is describing the contrast of night and day, and the contrast of male and female, how these things are contradictory. Just like that, your efforts are contradictory. Because they're all over the place. In a religious sense, and in a not religious sense also. In the religious sense, we would say, for example, that you know, you have... Uh, you know, the Muslims are making efforts for the establishment of deen, for the victory of deen. And the non-Muslims are making efforts in what direction? In the destruction of deen, to harm the deen and its teachings, right? So two are making efforts in opposite, opposing directions. But then, in dunya also, every one of us has a different job, different responsibility. It seems like we're all headed in a different direction. Every one of us is headed in some other direction. Each one of us have our own problems. But the word shatta is really beautiful and remarkable. There are two words in Arabic for diverse or different. In Quran anyway, mukhtalif, mukhtalif, and shatta. Mukhtalif is two very different things. Shatta is something that was once one, and it was shattered, and now it's become dispersed. So what we're learning is, humanity and our efforts were supposed to be what? They were, they were supposed to be one. كَانَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً wahida. Man, humanity altogether used to be one nation. It used to be united. So our efforts are supposed to be one. And the fact that they are diverse, it's still, they come together in the end to become part of a whole. That's what we're learning by use of the word shatta here. Just like night and day come together to be part of a whole, our efforts, even the efforts of the disbelievers against the efforts of the believers, are part of a larger plan. Just like day and night come together, male and field come together, these opposite forces also come together, they're part of a larger plan. This changes the way we look at the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. It changes the way we look at the efforts of those who try to hurt Islam. It's all part of the process. It's part of the process. So in other words, you have the people you know, offending and oppressing the Messenger of Allah ﷺ and those who believe radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een. They're oppressing them. That, those are their efforts. And the Sahaba, they're making efforts to spread this deen. To spread its message. And they're being pitched. Two opposite efforts. But if these efforts don't collide, then the ayat don't come down that command them to have sabr. And the instructions don't come down for them to go and make hijrah. All the events of the life of the Prophet ﷺ are not the result of one direction effort. Like it's not just the effort of the believers. What else is going on? A, conf a conflicting effort of disbelievers. That's what creates the situation. So it's part of a larger plan. Don't complain about it, understand it's part of the plan, it's part of the test. Subhanallah. Inna sa'yakum lashatta. But then you have to figure out what side of this are you on. And we'll close with this ayah, inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, by the way, shatta, uh, you should know one more thing about it. Shatta is the plural of shatit in Arabic. Shatit, which also means broken and dispersed, is the plural of it. And the antonym, the lid of it, is ta'lif, allafa. Like Allah says, fa'allafa bayna qulubikum. It's to take pieces of something that were broken up and put them perfectly back together and fuse them and make them unbreakable again. Allah uses that word describing the high hearts of the believers. فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ That's the opposite of the word shatta. It's ta'lif. Okay?
And by the way, this word shatta will come up again in a different form later on in another surah when we're going to read يَوْمَ إِذِينَ يَصْدُرُ النَّاسُ أَشْتَاتَ Same word will come up again in a different uh, uh, morphology form, inshaAllah. Another thing about the use of the word shatta, we should probably end on the word shatta and then uh, take a break for the salah, is we said shatta is something that was originally together and then it was broken apart. Look at the oaths that came before. How beautiful the placement of this word. When Allah talks about day, He says, وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ اللَّيْلِ نَسْلَخُ مِنْهُ النَّهَارِ A miraculous, a special miraculous sign for them is the night. We snatch the day out of it. We pull the day out of it. So Allah is describing day being broken away from night. Just like the word shatta means something that is originally one and it's broken up. Then Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنثَى where did Untha come from? Where did our mother Hawa come from? Wasn't she broken away from Adam alayhi salam? Right? So the word Shatta is really, really articulate and beautiful here because it complements the lessons that are coming in the beginning of the surah. وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنثَى SubhanAllah How Allah Azza wa Jal uses these remarkable, remarkable words not just to describe our situation but our situation, you, you will find parallels for them in nature. You'll find lessons for life and the struggle of the Muslim and the things that are around you. Allah Azza wa Jal changes the way we think about the world around us. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us an ability to, to properly reflect on the Quran and the Sunnah of His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We'll continue with ayah number five after the break. Subhanallah.